It ain't no use if it ain't chartreuse. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting, awesome, amazing milestone of an episode for the Average Ontario Anglers Fishing Podcast. That's right. This is the big 75. Wow. (laughs) We're getting close to 100. We'll let you know when that happens, but 75 episodes. And that's why we played our groovy, cool, OG, super old (laughs) intro music. We're just doing it this time because it's it's nostalgic. It's nostalgic. Now, Jesse... Did you ever think we'd get this far? (laughs) You know, we haven't said this in so long, but I never thought we would get past episode 36. I never thought we'd get past episode (laughs) 7. Yeah. (laughs) So if you've been following along this long, or if you just started and you've never heard that OG uh, intro before, thanks for following along. And uh, here's to the next 75 episodes. Yeah, I like that. Positivity. Jesse's always going on, we'll stop doing it with stop being fun. And now he just said... We're locked in for 75 more episodes. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have a, a really cool podcast topic for you today. And we know it's going transitioning into the fall season. And a lot of people think big baits, big baits, big baits. And yeah, that's true. It's awesome. But at the same time, it still works even in the fall. There are still going to be days when fish are going to be finicky. There are still going to be days when you need a nice, perhaps smaller finesse presentation. The topic is Ned Riggs. And I'm oh. talking about like, hey, diddly ho, neighbor. <laughs> I, have an, I have a Ned rig for you, buddy. No, I'm not that Ned. We're a different Ned. This one isn't built as muscular. And I don't want to see him going down the ski hill because they're small baits like this. And they're not very like built up. <laughs> but it feels like you're casting nothing at all. <laughs> for those uh, Simpsons fans, you definitely got that uh, reference. Anyways, Jesse's a little lost. So we're going to move on to our interesting fishing fact. And Jesse has that handled for us this week. And I've heard that he's kind of kept it on topic. So you might be experiencing this huge, giant, deep dive into the Ned Rig world. So I totally lied. It's totally off topic. I, I just said that to throw Andrew off the scent. <laughs> so I thought I'd, I'd do kind of a story time interesting fishing fact at the same time. This is something that happened to me recently. About three weeks ago, I was camping. Uh, up near North Bay. And I had a particularly good day. We had just got to the backcountry site. We had set up our tents, our hammocks. We were ready to go. Andrew wasn't there because he was at, at his cottage. But what happened was I went out fishing. And within two hours of fishing on a new lake, I actually caught a good muskie, which is rare for someone like me who is an average angler. But I caught a good muskie and actually caught it on the classic Rapala Super Shad Wrap in this old OG... This is an old OG Finland one. So it's an old one that I got at Cancast at the Tackle Swap. I recognize because you can't get that color anymore. Don't you can't get this. This color is called Brown Craw or something like that. It's kind of, it kind of looks like a goldfish. It's like orange it's at the bottom. Like a, there's bright like orange. It's a smallmouth pattern almost. Didn't they mark almost. it as a smallmouth pattern? Mm, it's called Brown Craw. Hmm. So it, it's not really brown at all. The, the top has a little bit of brown on it, but it's pretty much just like, I, I describe it as like an orange fire tiger almost, but just orange and brown. It sounds disgusting, but you look at this lure and it just screams fish. And every time I see this lure now, I bought it. I have three of them now. Great muscular. It's not a huge muscular, but it is a great lure. It works really good. You can cast it. You can troll it. You can fish it so many different ways. And the way that I was fishing this one was I was fishing it like a dive and rise. So you, what you do is you cast it out. It floats because it's made of balsa wood. And then you just like jerk your rod down. And it'll dive down into the weeds, not that far, maybe a foot or two. And as it dives down, it has this tight little wiggle. And then you think, oh, I'm going to snag because it's in the weeds. But no, you stop and it floats back up. So you can fish this over shallow weeds very effectively. And then if you get to an open spot, you can continually jerk it in for that erratic action. Or you can just straight retrieve it. And then say you're heading back to the the campsite or to the launch, you control it. Like it's a very versatile lure. Anyway, I caught caught a musk in that I was pretty happy. And it, it absolutely smashed it. When it rose up to the surface, it came up and smacked it on the surface. So that, that was cool. But that's not the interesting fishing fact. After I caught that fish, I was on cloud nine. I was so happy. You know, when you catch a good fish, finally, especially musky, because they're so hard to catch. And you're just like, yeah, it's awesome. So I was going back to the site. I'm standing in the water, pulling my, my sports pal canoe with a little two and a half horsepower on the back. And I felt something brush along my leg along the shoreline. And I, I, I didn't think anything of it because, you know, we fish a lot of lakes that are full of weeds and, you know, branches and stuff like that. 
but this particular lake is mostly rock. So I was like, okay, something touched my leg. That's kind of weird. And I didn't think anything of it. All of a sudden I look down and there is a three foot long water snake right beside my leg right there. And like, I'm not afraid of snakes, but I like to know where they are. Like, I don't want to just look down and see it like almost wrapped around my leg. So I was kind of like, oh crap, look at this. It's huge. So I called my buddy and his wife over and they're looking at it and they're like, holy smokes, that thing is huge. And it was a Northern water snake, which I'm sure if you've ever been anywhere around Ontario, and we're going to talk about this, they're, they're quite common. I'm sure me and Andrew have seen more than a few over the years. This is probably one of the biggest one that I've seen. I've been bitten by a fair share myself too. <laughs> and we're going to get into that, but spoiler alert, they're not poisonous. So anyway, <laughs> as you can tell, because Andrew's still here. But this, this is probably the biggest one I've seen. I'd estimate it at least three feet long. Uh, apparently they get bigger. We're going to get into that. But as I was looking at this snake, it had a full-size toad, like not like a little toad. It was a big toad in its mouth. And I felt bad because it was kind of like one of those like nature's metal scenarios. But this snake had this big toad in his mouth and the toad was kind of like its arms and head were hanging out of its mouth. And it was trying to hang on to things like branches and stuff along the shoreline <laughs> so it wouldn't get killed. And, you know, we poked it with a stick that not the toad, the snake, because I was trying to show them. I got a few pictures of it and uh, it slithered away. At, you know, the sun was setting. It was kind of majestic. See this like, you know, snake slithering along the surface with this toad in its mouth and then just disappeared underwater. And, and that got me thinking. I was like, I don't really know a lot about water snakes. Um, again, a very common occurrence. Some lakes more than others. I remember that one lake, Andrew, I think that was Balsam, Balsam Lake. Balsam we Lake at. is loaded. Full of snakes. Full of loaded. <laughs> yeah. So you may think, where are these snakes? Are they all over the place? The answer, sadly, is yes, if you're afraid of snakes. So <laughs> the northern <laughs> water snake, it basically... It's not all over Canada. Luckily for us in Ontario, it's mostly in Ontario and uh, Quebec. So basically, it's southwestern Quebec, across southern Ontario, into central Ontario, pretty much north to North Bay, which is where I was. That's pretty much as far north as they go there. And they go all the way east uh, to the shore of Lake Superior. And it's actually one of the most common snakes that you'd find around lakes. Now, it's not the only water snake in Ontario, but this is by far the most common one. Now, I, I was kind of curious about how big these things can actually get, because generally, like on this trip, I actually did end up seeing a few more water snakes, but most of them were pretty small. But Andrew, what would you say is the average size of these snakes? Just like a normal one. Most of the time when I see them, they're maybe 18 to 20 inches long. Yep. I have seen a few that like a handful maybe that reached about three feet, but that's about it. And at three feet, they're they're getting thick. Like they're a pretty terrifying it's snake. It's big. <laughs> if you were afraid of snakes, this would be terrifying, <laughs> especially just knowing it's out there, you know, if you're trying to swim or sit on the shoreline because they're always on the shoreline like hunting for frogs and, yeah. you know, other things too. Like the ones I've seen, they've been about as I used to have a ball python and it's about that size. Like ball pythons get between three and four feet long usually the odd yep. female can be six feet but like three and four foot like that's a substantial snake <laughs> like <laughs> that's a decent snake for sure so it says that the the average length of these northern water snakes is when they're adults is between 24 inches but they can be <laughs> over 45 inches long so we're talking almost four feet long now that doesn't sound that big but like andrew said snakes are kind of like northern pike once they hit that 30 inch mark, they start to get girthy. <laughs> so <laughs> these snakes, they, they get pretty big. I mean, you could see definitely possibly a 48 inch water snake swirling around in the water there. Now you may wonder, how do they get so big? What do they eat? Well, they eat toads, obviously, as we found out, but <laughs> it says the war, the Northern water snake, it eats fish amphibians mostly. If it's around your campsite, it usually eats a glizzy or two. <laughs> <laughs> I had no hot dogs that trip actually, <laughs> but yeah, so its main source of food is actually fish. So these, these snakes actually have the ability to stalk and hunt fish underwater. That's pretty, that's pretty creepy. I, I, I knew that because I found out firsthand <laughs> it was terrifying because I was catching sunfish and I had like one of the biggest ones I've seen personally, it latched onto the sunfish that was on the end of my line. Wow. Like, and it it fought me because all of a sudden I'm fighting this little like three inch sunfish, and then all of a sudden I'm fighting this four foot behemoth or three foot Ugh. behemoth. Like it was terrifying on an ultralight, and it would not let go. Like it it held on to that fish. 
They're, see, they are pretty much like northern pike. They attack yeah. fish that are on the line. So yeah, they eat fish and amphibians. Like there's oftentimes lots of frogs and uh, toads, obviously too. And actually, this camps that we were on, there was toads everywhere. You had to be careful not to step on them. That's why they're everywhere. Maybe that's why there were so many snakes there. <laughs> but I, I thought there were some interesting facts about these snakes really quick. Obviously, this article, it's funny. It's like, these are excellent swimmers. Obviously, they're called water snakes. They're obviously excellent swimmers. It's like, if they're called the water snake, they drowned all the time. <laughs> snakes in general swim very well. Yeah. So the cool thing is these snakes can dive up to three meters below the surface and can be found several kilometers from shore. So they can swim far. That's crazy. They're not just going for a little like jump over the puddle there. Like they're going across the lake in the middle of the lake. Imagine being like three, four kilometers offshore and you see a four foot snake swim by. Like, That's... what are you doing here? <sighs> Hunting. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine then going into your bilge pump. You're like, ah, <laughs> kind of going up inside. <laughs> Just turn it on. Ugh. It says, although the snake usually swallows small prey head first upon capture. This is the, the funny part or gruesome part, I guess. It may carry large fish to shore before consuming them. So you may see just a random snake carrying a large fish to shore to consume it later. And they can actually hold stuff out of the water with their head, can't they? Like, yep. like even yep. that toad, I think when you're you're showing me some photos, like it's swimming away and yep. it's holding this like heavy toad in its face and it's above water just going away. Maybe imagine it seeing... didn't want to get water in its mouth. I don't know. Yeah. I'll have to like, ask imagine it next time. seeing like, like a, a, a snake Again, a kilometer offshore, and all of a sudden you're like fishing this school of bass, and just a snake swims by with its head out of the water, holding like a fish, taunting you, like you stuck, you, you suck. I caught something you didn't. <laughs> We're gonna have <laughs> to make our days. own mythical beast of a water snake legend. <laughs> we'll have to do that for Andrew's next uh, fishing lore episode coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the last fact I'm going to tell you about these these water snakes. Now again, they're not the most beautiful snakes that you ever see. They're kind of a brown molted color, but they're good looking snakes. Their pattern is gorgeous. It, it's gorgeous. Yeah. But uh, this is this is the scary part about these snakes. So be warned if you're someone that is afraid of these slippery devils. They're not slippery, but you know what I mean? In the water <laughs> there. So it says that northern water snakes are curious and not as wary as humans as other snakes are. So normally you see like a garter snake or something and you see it, it sees you, and it's gone in the opposite direction. Water snakes are actually curious and oftentimes will come up to humans to investigate what's going on. So that's terrible. It says that it may even approach swimmers as it investigates the source of ripples in the water, which could be from a fish or other prey, or if it mistakes them for a floating log or other debris it can hide on. So if you're floating in the water, paddling around, don't be you know too freaked out if a four-foot-long water snake... <laughs> slithers up to you tries to eat you for one or thinks you're a piece of floating debris that it can bask on so that's terrifying but anyway that was my story and that's some a little bit of terrifying info about the northern water snake which you can find in ontario so when people say that all the dangerous snakes are in you know australia pff, they clearly haven't been to ontario people we have snakes that are curious and may bite you but like andrew said they're not poisonous so don't yeah. worry if they do bite you thankfully <laughs> it's it's terrifying especially i've had some little guys swim up again balsam lake i was swimming in a back bay there were a few like, always like dozens of snakes you'd find along the shoreline but the, a couple times they would actually swim towards me and i didn't understand it i just catch them and i think it's fun i'm holding a water snake it would bite me on my thumb like whatever yeah but now it makes sense like they're so curious to do that i it's terrifying when you see animals at like pov like at their level sometimes when they're predatory, <laughs> I can't imagine seeing a large snake come towards me. I'd Ugh. feel like John Voight and Anaconda. Anaconda. Be like, oh. <laughs> and that just goes to show you, Andrew has one of those Savage Gear wake snakes. Oh, yeah. And I always thought it was gimmicky. Like, again, I'm not going to say fish don't eat snakes. I'm sure they do, especially bass and, and bigger predatory fish. But if, if you're fishing a lake that has a lot of snakes in them and the juvenile snakes are maybe like 10, 12 inches long. 100% a pike or a muskie or a bass is going to come up and eat that thing, even mm -hmm. if it's two feet long, right? Yeah. So maybe we'll have to talk to our buddy Wam Bates to make a, a big plastic snake for us. Ooh. Yeah. It just looks a big eel like coming through the water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I, I like that. I like story time, Jesse. It's always good. So you made me a liar. 
But hey, it was worth it for a story time. <laughs> See, I was going to do an interesting fishing fact on the history of the Ned Rig. Then I'm like, boring. Let's talk about something that's deadly. <laughs> Back in 2017 when it was invented. No. <laughs> <laughs> So going back to our main topic, Ned Rigs. Now, the first thing you're probably asking is, Andrew, Jesse, what is a Ned Rig? And can I use it if my name isn't Ned? The short answer, no. You have to be called Ned in order to purchase these. You need to show your license at the fishing store. And uh, second of all, that was also a lie. So you can, <laughs> anyone can do these. They're a versatile bait, but also like you fish them pretty similarly. We're going to go into a lot of different techniques, but you, when you first see it, you're going to look at what does that do? It, it must do nothing. And spoiler alert, that's one of the techniques. <laughs> so the, for a description of it, I actually have my tackle tray somewhere. There it is. And Ned Riggs essentially is just a jig head. It's a weighted hook. And Traditionally, it just has an exposed kind of straight shank hook with a, a standard jig hook. You can also get some now. They have a Texas rig uh, style hook, like an offset hook. So you can Texas rig your Ned rigs. But traditionally, it's just a kind of a flat headed, it's almost like a, a lead puck that's on a jig hook, mushroom shaped head. They usually weigh between 1 16th up to around an eighth of an ounce. You can get heavier ones. They make them all the way up, I think. I've seen some of the big ones up towards like a half ounce. Yep. Three eighths for sure, at least. But you put a, a short, soft plastic bait on these things. Now, the original Ned bait, picture a stick bait, like a Sanko or something like that. And you take that and you bite half of it off. And what you're left with is essentially a Ned bait. <laughs> yes. That's kind of how it all started was guys using half their stick baits and fishing them. So many brands make them now. you got Berkeley, Strike King, the, the, the Robo Worm. All of these make Ned baits because it becomes so popular in recent years. Jess and I have talked before how the biggest thing that's been coming up in and reoccurring, the biggest theme with fishing recently has been finesse. So it's yep. no no surprise that Ned baits have become more popular. And as a little teaser, we're going to be talking shortly about uh, another manufacturer who also has a nice variety of different Ned baits that you should definitely check out. That's a little teaser. We're going to get into that in a little bit. But first of all, I want to ask Jesse, when would you choose to fish a Ned rig? Well, as a power fisherman, the answer is never. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I think, like you said, Ned baits or Ned rigging in general, it's been popular for, I don't know, a dozen years, but it's it's not one of those fad techniques. It's one of those techniques that every year it's, it's holding on, and that's because it's an effective technique. And for a long time, I kind of shied away against Ned rigs because, again, I'm a power guy. I fish a lot of shallow, weedy lakes. But when I start fishing with Andrew, we fish, you know, more finesse style. So I started giving it a go. I was always kind of against them. Like, oh, you know, there's that kind of prejudice against Ned Bates. It's like, oh, that's for stupid people. And, you know, get your fairy wand spinning, you know, reels and rods out. But the fact is it catches tons of fish in almost every situation. Like when the bite's tough, they'll smack a Ned rig. When the bite's good, they'll smack a Ned rig. So it's, it's one of those baits that you should probably have tied on or ready to go anytime. But one of my favorite times to do it is when I'm fishing for smallmouth bass. It's such a good smallmouth bass bait, especially in clear water because it's such a natural presentation. So for me, generally it's a smallmouth bass bait, although you can catch everything. We caught walleye this spring on it, you know, largemouth, smallmouth, walleye, like everything. How but many for times me, had pike bite us off. Oh, <laughs> so many times. Rigs, like... it, it just, it imitates, it's such a natural presentation. It looks good. So I'd say there's no bad time to throw a Ned rig. If you can get away with it, have it as an option for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's one of those things it's for me, it's not something that I will always go to first, but it's definitely in the first half of my rotation of things to try. I, I like to go to it fairly soon, soon on in the day, especially, you know, if the bite is tough, that's when it, I, I break it out and I start fishing a Ned rig. It goes deep. If again, if a storm has come in, fish are usually deeper. Ned rig is super effective. It's still lightweight, still finesse. But because it was designed, it sinks super quick right to the bottom. <laughs> you can fish them really effectively. Now we're going to uh, very briefly kind of go into a few different types of the actual jig heads. We talked a little bit about it, but the standard mushroom jig head, uh, it actually will stand up. It's the most popular. It's the original. And when you have it, when you let it sink down on a, on a slack line or whatever, it hits the bottom. And because all the weight is right there at the top of that bait, it actually stands upright. So it's designed to just have that little stick kind of thing poking up in the air and the weight will just settle right there on the, on the, on the hard bottom, whatever it may be. 
but you also have other Ned, Ned heads now. So they kind of have more like an arrowhead on it. They have, like I said, the offset hook. They have the Outcast Perfect Ned head. Uh, that's another one of the offset weedless versions. So you can Texas rig it. So they're more designed to kind of come through weeds a bit cleaner without getting a bunch of stuff hooked onto that head. So they have a variety of different ones. Take note of wherever you are fishing. Like I said, the different shape of the head can do a lot. Uh, I know in the past we've talked about different jig heads, the difference between a, a football jig head, its purpose, it's really good for just like rolling along in the bottom. If you have a swim jig head, it's really good for coming, passing through weeds. You wouldn't cast a football jig in with a weed bed. Like it just won't work uh, as effectively. So it's helpful to have a couple different options of style of net heads. But another thing is the weight itself. So you can have like a heavier, like we said, up to, up to a half ounce of the big ones. I have some big ones actually. I want to use them targeting for pike. But you can get super finesse ones. So if you're fishing shallow, you don't want the bait to sink super fast or depending on the technique you want to use, you can have these things be super shallow or, or super light, but you have a, a wide range of what you want to do. But the important thing oftentimes that each of the presentations is to maintain that bottom contact. And usually you go for a heavier head when you want to do that. Again, depending on the technique. So let's go into a, a couple different ones. There are, uh, well, first of all, I want to ask Jesse, do you have a preferred jig style? So we'll talk about that one first then. If you have a preferred style of jig, do you like one that is kind of more the traditional sits in the bottom, a heavier head, or would you rather go with a lighter head or something? Yeah. So I know we're going to get into this in the different techniques. It depends what I'm doing, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of my most effective techniques is when it the, the Ned bait actually has a very slow glide. So obviously mm -hmm. a thinner head, but or a lighter head. But one head myself that I really, I tried it this year. I thought it was going to be gimmicky, but I actually really liked it. And I don't know if it was just because I'm dumb <laughs> or if I just, you know, it actually was good. Sometimes you buy a certain jig head or whatever, and you just have confidence in it. And then that bait's going to work better for you. It was that those new VMC swinging Ned heads. Mm -hmm. Did I show you that? So it's a, it's a half moon head, mm -hmm. but the hook is actually like a Neko hook, but it's attached in the head, not solidly. So the hook can actually swing around. So when you have that floating Ned bait, uh, when it hits the bottom, they float a lot of them and it can just kind of pivot around and swing around. And I just felt like maybe the thing has more action in the bottom. But the other cool thing I liked about it is it has the Neko hook. So you can either hook it right through the worm and have the, the hook exposed, or you can actually rig it weedless, mm -hmm. which again, we went fishing on that lake for walleye and there's lots of timber and rocks. And I, I was getting snagged a lot with a regular net head. So I put this swing net head on and I kind of rigged the bait weedless, although it wasn't weeds, it was rocks and branches. <laughs> and I actually... Did, I did well. I was pulling some walleye out of branches and timbered in deep water and I wasn't snagging up. So for me, I think you get more action on a smaller head, not one of those weedless like stock hook ones, the ones you were talking about, the EMG mm -hmm. ones. But I like to try new things. I think that swing one for me, it's just like I have a lot of confidence in it. But yeah, I, I answered your question with like four things. <laughs> That's all right. We're going to be going over all of them again. One by oh, one. Nice. <laughs> that is cool. Those heads are, are very neat and it's good because if you had to get one, it's probably the most versatile style you probably could get. That's what I was thinking. Because I mean, if you're in open water, you just hook it regularly. And mm -hmm. if you have some, you know, something that's going to snag you, you just hook it weedless. And the, these Ned baits, they're, they're so soft. You don't have to worry about, you know, using heavier line. Even when it's hooked weedless on a medium light rod, when you pull back hard, it's going to hook them every time. Mm -hmm. Now, the first technique I want to talk about for myself that I love doing it is surprisingly effective. It's also probably one of my favorite topwater techniques is just the dead sticking technique. <laughs> and this is not so much as a search bait, but if you have a spot and it's perfect, you see bed of rock or sand, and all of a sudden you see this little stand of cabbage, or you have like a specific spot you want to pitch a Ned rig at. All you do is cast out to that spot. It hits the water, it sinks, and you let it sit there. <laughs> and it's, again, one of those things where it's such you're looking at this jig head with a little stick on it and it's just sunk to the bottom and it's just standing upright. And you're like, what is this going to do? And for some reason, fish are like, hmm, delicious. I'll eat that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a very, probably the easiest technique you could do. You're not going to cover a lot of water with it, but it can be very effective if you know that there are fish there or you're confident that there is a fish in that nearby area. But the Another one that we could talk about would be the drag and shake. So this one you can kind of mimic with it. It allows you to cover a bit more water, 
So you cast out, you let it sit down to the bottom, you do nothing, you reel in, and you just kind of reel in slowly, or you just slowly sweep your rod. You don't want to lift it off the bottom, your your net bait. You want to just drag across in the bottom, drag it a couple feet, and you stop. And with that taut line, you just kind of quiver your rod in your hand, and the tip of the rod is moving a little bit, and that vibration is going down to the head of that jig. And what will happen is, because it wants to sit upright, when you shake that line, It's actually kind of pulling it a bit, and it's going to make that bait wiggle. So it's just the drag and shake. You drag a little bit, shake it. Again, slow presentation, bottom contact the entire time. So you have to take note of what you're fishing on top of. You might be losing a lot, depending on (laughs) the bottom structure of what you're fishing. So again, not every technique works for every area. But that is another one that is very easy to, to master. It's not hard to do. I know we talked before about different things. It's It can be tough or daunting to have to learn a whole new way to present a bait or a way to do something. This is taking it down to like the very easy steps while it's still very effective. And I might add that technique is a great technique for beginners. Yes. If you're taking someone that's, maybe they, they fish, but they, they're fishing for them is chucking a MEP spinner and you feel the bite. And fishing a, a finesse technique may be difficult because you have to be like, you know, feel the bite and feel something off. And, you know, they don't know because they're a beginner or they're a kid. If you're casting out, letting it sit to the bottom and then just get them to drag their rod, they're going to feel a bite. Mm-hmm. And it's reel your line back to the rod and drag it. You're going to feel the, the Ned bait bump over all the rocks and then you're going to feel a tap when a fish inhales it. So it's yeah. a great technique. I've had my nephew, we, we've been fishing Ned, Ned bait. So it's, again, one of those techniques. It's like fishing a Sanko or a stick bait. It's just so easy. It's a great bait for every skill level. When you think of what it's mimicking, again, we talked before, it looks kind of stupid. It's so simple. But when that thing's in motion or moving around, if you've ever seen underwater footage of a goby or a crayfish, what do they do? They they shoot around in the bottom and they stop. And the crayfish might have its claws raised or something like that. Or a goby will just kind of sit there like a stick on its side and it doesn't move. They just sit there motionless. That's what these things are imitating. So are they effective? Absolutely. They're they're mimicking nature really, really effectively, actually, despite the look. Speaking of little crayfish, we actually have, I'm, now I'm going to talk about what kind of alluded to, another manufacturer that makes some pretty cool Ned Baits is Wham Baits. So Wes sent us some packages. He's actually redesigned his packaging. When I first saw it, all I could think of was the old Kellogg's cereal boxes when it's like new design same great taste (laughs) it's like let's test it (laughs) but these little handy bite-sized morsels this one is the cash and cross a two inch this is the sapphire blue this is an amazing little ned bait you want to talk about a ned bait again with that technique to be able to just drag it along the bottom and then it's just going to sit upright like that just waving its claws at you like to all our little viewers there that can't not get bit. Let's be honest. That looks amazing. <laughs> yeah, it does look good. And that that dragging technique, like you said, it just imitates a, a crayfish scuttling along the bottom. Like I know I like I like using the word scuttling all the time. But <laughs> Scuttle it, and sachet, the two best yes. motions for your lures. But with this Ned bait, no sacheting is involved. It's all scuttling. <laughs> all scuttling all the time. So yeah, that's a great bait. I would like to mention before we get kind of into the baits, mm-hmm. Wham, Wham Baits, West from Wham Baits has, has going to, I always call <laughs> him Wham. Wham. I call him <laughs> Wham. So anyway, he came over to my workshop the other day and dropped off some of these baits that we're going to ship out to you guys for the giveaway. And Wes is one of the nicest guys ever. I don't want to sound like we're, we're his parents or something, but we're so proud of Wes. He's done so much hard work. He's such a nice guy. He gives back to the fishing community greatly. He donates so many baits to fishing organizations and to kids. I think he donates as much as he sells or something. I heard like it's a lot. He is a super nice, legit guy and his baits are fantastic. We love buying his baits. Every time we go to CanCast, like his booth is like ravaged. Yes. Like you'll go and we're like, oh, we'll wait and we'll come back later. It's all gone. People bought it. It's good <laughs> stuff. We're really happy that his new packaging, it just looks fantastic. I told him like, this looks like a hundred percent professional. And I know, I know a lot of bait guys that are making baits when you eventually get your own custom packaging. Yeah. It just makes your stuff look amazing. And I have to say, Wes, if you're listening to this right now, this stuff looks fantastic. We're super proud of what your brand has become and your stuff works great. It's worked great for us. And I know a lot of our listeners have bought your stuff too. Mm-hmm. Tons of people in Ontario, all over Canada, people in the States buy it. Congrats, Wes. 
we're really, really happy that he's also been supporting this podcast since the beginning. So we're also very thankful for that. So let's talk about his, his Ned bait. So like you said, you had the little craw there. Yep. But if you want to get a legit regular Ned bait, he has his wham lamb Of course, Wes has all his cute little Wham names for all of his baits. <laughs> but listen to this. I'm going to open this. Oh, yeah. Hear that? He also has really cool colors. So this is his wham lamb This is a regular three inch. Three inch seems to be like the size everyone gets for, um, for Ned baits. Mm -hmm. This is a nice, very cool mold. It's a unique mold. It's not the same one that everyone else has. It floats. Look at that. It's got a lot of action to it. <laughs> this is sashaying right now. It's wiggling <laughs> around like crazy. So I'm holding this between my index finger and my thumb. Very still and it's just wobbling. I'm not moving it at all. And the thing's just wagging back and forth like a dog's tail. So imagine that on a jig head at the bottom. These float too. Just wiggling on the bottom. Another thing I really think that these imitate, Andrew is talking about the crawfish. This is literally a little stick bait pretty much. Mm -hmm. But I honestly think half the time, Fish think it's a crawfish just scuttling along the bottom. But oftentimes I think they think it's a minnow. Just You oftentimes see minnows just pecking at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes you have a Ned bait and it, it sinks down and then it hits the bottom and then you kind of hop it. It just looks like a minnow kind of pecking down at the bottom, not paying attention to its surroundings. Fish just comes up, especially a bass. It'll open its mouth, create that vacuum and just suck that little Ned bait in. And the fish will just swim off like nothing happened until you, you know, tighten the line and get a hook in them. So <laughs> that's a really good bait. I have to say with uh, Wham baits, he has all the hottest colors, but I'll tell you my favorite ones. You have to know this because this is his best color. In my opinion, Wes has a lot of good colors, but this is his best color right here. Green pumpkin copper. This is one of my favorite colors. I have it in several of his plastics. He, he makes the perfect green pumpkin. It's like a pukey brownish green. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of people, they make their green pumpkin too green. It should yes. really be called brown pumpkin because it's more of like a greenish brown. It's, it's, it's a disgusting color, but for yeah. some reason the fish love it. And then he has this perfect mixture of like copper and gold flakes in it. So it's got a little bit of flash, nothing crazy, just like a little scale in the distance the fish might see. But it's such a natural color. It looks like almost everything. It looks like a minnow. It looks like a crayfish. It looks like a leech. It looks like everything. So that to me is one of my favorite colors. If you can only have one color for an Ed rig, in my opinion, it should be some kind of a green pumpkin brownish color, in my opinion. What do you what do you say, Andrew? What's your favorite? I do like dark colors. I've done well with black. I do like a little bit of contrast. So if you get some sometimes you can get stuff that have like a little tip of color, or you can dip some yourselves to get a bit of bright color. Uh, but a two-tone, like a black and chartreuse or something like that, or like you said, a green pumpkin and a, and just a little bit of a bright color on the on the belly. I do like yep. that. This is another color that is going to be included in the giveaway. This is actually a three-inch wham a -lam. And his his color is called, I guess it's supposed to be Violent Tendencies, but it's violet because it's orange. Or it's purple. <laughs> so it's Violet Tendencies. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. But it's, yeah, it's purple and black. So again, you got some good contrast too. I think like we always talk about, I don't think color matters as much as how the bait is fished and the ability for the fish to see the bait. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you could have a bait that's black and purple. That doesn't really look like anything natural, maybe a leech or something. But if the fish can see it at the right depth and it's the right profile, you're going to catch fish. So we always recommend usually with almost every lure we talk about, have something bright, have something natural, have something dark, right? Yeah. So the same, in my opinion, goes with Ned Riggs. Again, you have a dark color, like Andrew said, you have a natural color, like green pumpkin. And then for those crazy days, get something bright pink or white, and you never know what you're going to catch. So <laughs> we're going to move on to well, a couple other, you done there, Jesse? <laughs> I was just going to say, we'll talk a little bit about this giveaway yes. in a little bit. Yes. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to get into what you have a chance to win. So that's kind of a hint look, of Listen to this. Have. Oh, just dropped them all. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, they fell on the ground. Five second rule. They're all Jesse's now. <laughs> <laughs> I planned that. A couple other techniques that work really well is getting a little bit faster with, with the presentation is the hop and pause. So Jesse kind of mentioned that too, kind of imitating a minnow of it, kind of feeding on the bottom. Simple to do, cast out, let it sink. Most of these are let it sink. It is a jig still. <laughs> so you cast it out. Once it sinks to the bottom, you just snap your rod up. You've heard us talk before about snap jig fishing for walleye. Ned rigs are also a very good option if you don't have a snap jig you could fish them the same way and target walleye, target bass, target whatever still. Very effective. And what happens is, again, the Ned bait, they usually are floating oftentimes. 
uh, in order to keep that upright presentation when it's resting on the on the bed of the the river or the water. So when you cast out and you let it settle, it sits for a second, and you just snap your rod up a few inches, like a foot or so, and it it shoots up erratically and then just kind of coasts down. And the Ned rigs, they'll often sink straight down pretty quick. You'll notice that when you cast out, you're like, I'm in 15 feet of water. How is a 16th ounce jig head or 8th ounce jig head or whatever going to sink down? And you cast out, it's gone. It's down to the bottom. <laughs> so they sink very quickly. But that, so you can kind of work it fairly quick back to the boat. It's going to settle back down nice, nice and, and quickly for you as you work it. But again, that works really well around rocks, submerged timber, stuff like that. Because you're lifting it up and over the cover and instead of like coasting down into a tree or something like that it usually just sinks straight back down so it can be really good for preventing uh snags when you're fishing some stuff that might be a bit more heavy cover but you can still fish something that has bottom contact the whole way across which is very effective now what if you have a spot that has even worse snags and you don't want it to touch bottom because you've lost about $25 worth of terminal tackle here this morning alone. <laughs> and you're like, I don't want to fish a Ned rig, but I don't want to just have it in contact with the bottom. It's called the swim and glide. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Much like what uh, we as adults like to do in the pool. You know, you dive in, you're like, ah, yes. And you just kind of like glide to the side of the pool because let's face it. None of us have done cardio in the past four years and we jumped in and that was a lot for today. So, <laughs> so you poor little Ned bait. <laughs> so picture your Ned bait being Michael Phelps. Just kidding. It's not a top water. So you, <laughs> you cast out and you can let it sink to whatever depth. Again, they sink pretty quick. So if you're fishing shallower water, you could pretty much start reeling right away. And you just have a slow, steady reel. You kind of fish it like you would with a swim jig. Fish it pretty much the same way. What will happen is as it's coming across... Any action on the water, it'll quiver that little back end of that bait a little bit, but you can kind of just lift your rod up and down and kind of quiver your rod tip. And as this thing comes across, it's going to be tipping off the tops of weeds, hitting off any timber, any rocks that are coming up, and you're just kind of swimming it across. You could be right above the bottom. You could be 10 feet up in the water column. It doesn't matter. As this thing comes across, it can mimic, again, like a minnow very well, but it can also be very erratic. And again, you might think of it, how could it be erratic? It's a little bit of a mushroom head of a jig head and accentless stick on the back end. But like I said, as soon as it hits any obstruction, even just the head itself, because of where that line tie is, it doesn't sit as far forward as other jigs may. That usually the, the eye of the hook is pretty close to the very front of the bait. So the weight on it is going to not quite like a hover rig, but it does sit a bit more horizontal in the water. It's when you're reel as you're reeling. So when that thing comes in, it is going to be picking up some vibration uh, from that water, resistance from the water and giving off some vibration. So even as its own, and again, you could even fish it with a little bit of a paddle tail. If you want to stop over area, you can let it settle. That paddle tail is still going to be moving around. It's going to sit head first in the bottom. So you could fish them effectively in the middle of the water column too. So again, speaking of versatility, that's just fantastic where, like Jesse said in his story time earlier, you have that super sad drop you could you know reel it in and then stop let it rise fish it over the weeds and keep cranking it you can do everything with it you can do the same thing with a ned rig you have that same hook that same head but you could fish it anywhere in that water column you could fish it really slow you could fish it quick along the bottom all that stuff you know what they say any lures a top water if you reel fast <laughs> enough <laughs> even a ned rig <laughs> I uh, I don't want to know how fast Jesse... Jesse's a power fisherman, so I could see him trying that. But <laughs> I'll tell you, though, one quick story slightly off topic. I was fishing one time, uh, drop shot fishing. Hey, and that's a finesse technique. I was fishing weed lines with a six-inch worm. And I chucked out this cast, and it kind of went, like, not where I wanted it. So I was just reeling it in fast along the surface. And it was literally, like, a quarter-ounce weight, you know, two feet of line and a worm just reeling fast across the surface and this two pound bass came up and smoked it and i caught it i was like dude i was <laughs> it was literally on the surface of the water with a huge sinker behind it <laughs> so sometimes fish are dumb a lot of time fish are dumb moral of the story is try stuff sometimes <laughs> find out uh, another thing when you're talking about ned rigs we're talking going to talk a little bit about what they can catch primarily it's a bass technique but if you don't target bass or let's say you're done targeting bass don't sleep on the ned rigs you may have heard 
so far what we talked about at different presentations and you're like, that could work for insert fish species here. And you're right. It totally could. A lot of guys, and you don't hear it talked about a whole lot, but again, because it is primarily a bass rig, primarily a smallmouth bass rig, I would say. Because guys, I don't really see a lot of largemouth guys fishing it because they're usually fishing weed, weedy heavy cover. But you could fish these really well around weed edges along the bottom where those bass are sulking around the side of that that thing. So again, and if you can go for this, they have really micro ones now too. You can get for crappy fishing, for perch. I actually yep. use them for ice fishing, which is, is really nice when those perch and stuff are only hitting stuff right in the bottom contact. A Ned Rig is fantastic fantastic because your bait is right there and i caught a few perch on that fishing it last year you can get walleye pike even musky we've been bit off by musky you can get anything and you can even get uh, i think it's called the giant trd i have like these huge yep. ones <laughs> yep. they look like a really thick sanko but they're actually a ned rig <laughs> i uh i've yet i've had a i did actually fish them for bass and i did get a couple this spring in the pre-spawn fishing those big things but I do want to, I did get them to target trying for pike and perhaps musky in the spring. But now we're going to talk about a few different advanced techniques. So what you've heard so Ooh. far is beginner or intermediate. Now it's advanced. If you want to really dial it in, we're going to talk about a few different variations. So you have your colors. Like Jesse said, it's good to have a variety of different colors, but if you have clear water, as is follow your normal color recommendations. So clear water, you have natural presentations, uh, green pumpkin, watermelon, shad stuff. In Ontario, it can be a big difference because we have so many lakes now that are such so much clearer than they used to be, the water yeah. clarity. So Ned rigs are really effective now because they get down deep where these fish are now as low as they can be in the water column because of the, the amount of light that's there. So they're down very deep. There's so much light still there that having these natural presentations are working really, really well. And when you see guys when they're fishing this, the, the tournament series and stuff like that in Canada and even in the St. Lawrence, but oftentimes in the Great Lakes especially, if you look what they're using, it's natural colors on finesse baits. That's what they do. So if that's yeah. where you're fishing, you can fish these awesome from shore too. Try that. I would go with more of a natural presentation. Uh, if they are being... Uh, picky or murky stained water you could go with bolder stuff like blue black chartreuse if you really want to see it chartreuse is fantastic <laughs> it ain't no it. use if it ain't chartreuse <laughs> that's my favorite not my favorite color overall sorry it's my favorite color overall I'm not gonna say it's my favorite ned rig color but i love i love chartreuse but how do you fish these what would you say jesse if you were going to fish a ned rig if you were going to recommend uh, the gear that would be required to effectively fish a ned rig what would you say like to actually have something like geared for it, what would you recommend? I know we live in a world now where there's specific gear for every single bait out there. Every fishing magazine, they'll be like, this is a Ned Rig rod. This is a frog rod. I'm trying to get away from that because it's such a scam. You don't need a specific <laughs> rod for a specific thing. Now, if you're, if you're a tournament angler, you're professional and money's on the line, that's what those rods are for because they want to have every advantage possible. But let's be serious. You can throw a Ned Rig rod on probably any rod you own and be effective with it. But mm -hmm. if I had to personally pick a rod to fish a Ned Rig on, in most situations, it's probably going to be a medium light spinning rod. I'd say anywhere between 610 and 73 medium light, extra fast tip. Mm -hmm. I want that tip extra fast. So when I feel a bite, when I pull back, it hooks them really fast and it's very sensitive. That's what I would use. Uh, 2,500, 3,000 spinning reel. And I'm probably going to go with an eight to 10 pound braid with a, a long, you know, six to 10 pound leader of some kind myself. Yep. I, I would have to agree. That's pretty much what I would, that's what I use to fish Ned rigs. If I have the, if I have multiple rods with me, I will. But like you said, you can fish it effectively on pretty much anything. I've mm -hmm. even fished it on my BFS combos, kind of like my Americanized BFS with some smaller rigs uh, that fishes them very well. But a medium light spinning rod is probably the most like ideal. Again, it's a finesse presentation, so you don't need a heavy rod. You're usually not going to be fishing these in heavy cover. You might fish it around, but you're not going to fish it in the actual heavy cover itself. So you don't need a, a super heavy line, which is great because most of our listeners, I would say, or most anglers in Ontario that have you know gone out, purchased fishing licenses, 
you probably have a medium or medium light spinning rod. That's probably what you already own. The only thing if you to have, uh, I would say the biggest benefit is like Jesse said, having a really crisp, like a nice extra fast tip on your spinning rod will really help you feel the difference between its bottom contact as you're reeling it in. You'll feel it kind of hitting against those rocks. You can get a bit more knowledge, even just from your cast as to what the bottom structure is like as you reel in and you'll be able to feel that bite. Mm-hmm. You'll usually feel a bite on any rod, I would say, pretty, pretty well. You now, some guys might, might get mad at me for saying that, like, oh, you can't feel bites on your stuff. Like, you can. It's just not as, like, they're present. You'll still feel a bite. <laughs> yeah. But having a, a crisp rod can actually help a lot. And one thing I think it would actually help with the presentation is one of those things where you don't need specialized gear by any means. But a faster rod tip, as you're reeling it in, if you're let's say you're doing the drag technique. If your bait is coming along and it's you know bumping against little bits of rock or into the mud and stuff like that, a soft tip will kind of like it bogs down and it pulls out and it bogs down and it pulls out. Whereas if it's a faster tip, it's immediately going to be kind of hitting that and then it's knocking over stuff. So it might have a little bit more of an erratic presentation, slightly. Not going to say you won't catch fish the other one. You absolutely will. But yeah. it is... That is what I would say would be your your biggest benefit. Just have a crisper rod if you have if you have a choice between a couple different rods. Yeah, and just to go in quickly, I know I get people ask me this. We we literally are going to do an episode on the different actions and powers mm-hmm. of rods and what they mean. I've had a, a, more than a few people ask me that. So when it comes to rods, rod power and action is completely different. So power is going to be like ultra light, light, medium light, medium heavy, heavy, extra heavy, extra extra heavy extra 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 heavy <laughs> but so for ned rig say a medium light rod is going to be it's going to be able to handle less weight or less power have less power than a medium heavy rod and then the action of the rod is where the rod starts to flex when it's under load mm-hmm. so like andrew said an extra fast rod only the top 10 or 15 percent of the rod actually bends when you're you know retrieving and a fast rod might be, you know, 25 to 30%. So the fat extra fast tip, just the tip of the rod bends a little bit. Obviously, when you hook a fish, more of the rod bends. Mm-hmm. But when you're retrieving and you're pulling it over rocks, like Andrew said, less of the rod is moving. So it's more sensitive because only a little bit of the rod's moving. So you can like bump it over rocks and stuff without half of your rod flexing and just being less sensitive. And I will mention one more thing. Those Canadian custom rods we had, yeah. those are both great Ned rods. And again, we like trying a bunch of different rods. We got our hands on a few of those new Daiwa Canadian custom rods on a walleye trip. That's where we use them so far. I had the seven foot one medium light extra fast. And I think you had the 610 medium extra medium. fast. I asked, that's become my go-to spinning rod, honestly. I've yeah. used that a lot for bass. All that, it's been really nice. I really yeah. like that rod. <laughs> I, I, they're actually really nice rods. And yeah. a lot of them are two piece, which is great. I think yes. you got the one piece. I got the two piece. I, I have one piece, but I, yeah, a two piece is fantastic. I will say though, that that Canadian custom rod, their extra fast action is pretty good. Oftentimes when you spend, you know, when you're buying a b- more budget rod, the actions are kind of mushy and generic. But the extra fast action on those rods, it's very crisp. It's a very crisp rod for $120. So if you're looking to get a new rod for next year or this fall, maybe, uh, definitely you know go to sale, go to Ganyan Sports, go to your local fishing store and check out those rods because they're very affordable price. They're really high quality and the actions are really good, especially for you know bottom contact baits. It's a sensitive rod. This may be a big step up for you if you've never bought a rod over $100. But if you do... Believe me, your world it's, is about to change. Really good value for that price range. Yes. So yeah, if you're looking for something in that price range, I would definitely say to consider those. The last just one, one more thing. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like Columbo. Just one more thing. <laughs> Before I go. <laughs> the last thing we're going to talk about regarding net rigs is yet another technique. Ooh. It's whatever you want technique. Because we you've already heard us you know there's that do nothing method the dead stick there's the drag it there's the little hop there's the snap there's the reel it in straight there's all kinds of things anything in between you can do if you want to do a variation of those on every single cast go for it so depending where you're fishing you might want to choose one technique over another but ned baits whenever i I, it's become one of those things where actually on that canadian custom rod i usually have that tied on 
uh, a Ned rig recently. I've been fishing them more this year. I realized how often I want to throw the Ned rig when I'm going around and sometimes I'll try and like fish slow. So I'll, I'll cast multiple different baits at one spot. And every spot I go to, I'm like, oh, I got to bring out the Ned rig. That would work well here. <laughs> yeah. You know, my like, oh, Rocky point. I should use a Ned rig here. Like, Oh, by yeah. a tree. I should use a Ned rig here. It's <laughs> so versatile. Dock, I should use a Ned rig here. Like you can, yep. you can flip these things. It doesn't matter. You can put them anywhere. And again, the only reason why I don't fish them in heavy cover is because it's, I'm usually fishing on a, on a medium light or a medium rod. But like I said, I have some Texas rig jig heads and I have fished them on my medium heavy and I have fished them in cover. And guess what? They catch fish. <laughs> yeah. So if there's anything, you can rip them like hair jigs through there. Do whatever you want. You can fish these things however. So if you have heard something you want to try, a technique, by all means, go out, try it. You don't have to get complicated. If you haven't bought it, if you don't use a lot of soft plastics, because for a long time, I didn't use a lot of soft plastics because I thought I don't know how to fish them properly. I have to put all the action into this bait. I'd rather just cast and retrieve. If you want to do that with an Ed rig, you can. But it's also one of those baits where as soon as you start learning a couple of these other techniques, which may just be real slow or don't reel at all or shake your rod as you reel in, all these different things, they're very easy to learn. And it's a great, I would say probably one of the best techniques or best uh, types of fishing to use that bait, to use a Ned bait and try and challenge yourself to learn different techniques. You're not going to have to change your bait. You're not going to retie all this stuff. And if you know what, this isn't working today, try the next technique. If that's not working, try the next technique. And you can be very versatile without having to change your bait all the time. I know we've, we've talked about a few different baits this year and we always or often use the word versatile. And that's because Justin and I have been trying more and more we're fishing these back lakes. You might laugh at us, but we only have four rods with us. <laughs> <laughs> Each. Each. You know, that's, it's four baits tied on only. You look at these yeah. guys in the tournaments. Yes, they have 75 rods in their boat and each have, you know, they have some rods with the same bait on it. So then they catch five fish next rod and they pick up the next one with the same bait because that's what's working. <laughs> they don't want to retie. But for us, I just like not having to change my bait. So having four very versatile baits tied on at all times, especially with new water, I can, I know, and I'm confident in how I'm fishing that water. So if you haven't tried it, I, I really encourage, you know, anyone listening, if you haven't tried, try an end rig. And to add to that, like you said, exactly what Andrew said, if you're well, in no sense repeating it, thanks Jesse. That's what yeah. <laughs> But if you've been fishing for a long time, this is not new. Let's be serious. Ned rig fishing isn't anything revolutionary. It's literally jig fishing. It's jig fishing slightly reimagined. But if you are someone that has not tried the Ned the Ned rig, I guarantee you, if you buy a bunch of Ned Ned baits, like some of the Wham baits, buy some heads and your favorite color, the color that you have confidence in, and you go out on the lake and like Andrew said, you learn that technique and you try a bunch of the different techniques with a Ned. It is well worth it. It's one of those techniques that it will never go out of style. It's like a stick bait. It always works because it's so natural and versatile and it works for so many different species. It'll be well worth your time to learn how to do the Ned rig. It catches everything. It's cheap. It's easy to do. Why not learn how to do it? That's what we're telling you people. Learn the Ned rig. <laughs> and the last thing I'll mention on that topic as well, just continuing that thought is you can then take those skills you've learned by fishing the Ned Rig and fish other baits in a similar way. If you're fishing the Ned Rig, you're you're reeling it in, you're shaking a rod tip, guess what? You're well in your weights learning how to do hover strolling, the latest thing now in, in tournaments. If you are fishing on the bottom dragging it, guess what? That's like fishing a football jig. If you're casting it through weeds in a weedless, that's a swim jig. You can take these skills by using the Ned Bait. It's one that can do pretty much everything. But then you can start branching out into some other baits using the same technique, but with a different bait may have a little bit different action or a bit better advantage in a certain situations. So it's a great kind of jumping off point for you. Now we're going to talk before we end the show, we have, a, we're going to talk about the giveaway. Mm. So Wham Baits, we have all these awesome bags. They look awesome. The baits inside look even better. <laughs> the packaging, I just have to say the packaging yeah. looks it looks absolutely fantastic. Good not that it matters. I mean, like you're going to take the bait out and the fish doesn't see the package. <laughs> but again, it looks really good. And it's there's a warning on the back of these, though. Do not eat these. These are not for human consumption as good as they as they look. So <laughs> I'm going to show you some of these baits quick because he actually gave us a whole box of baits. Now, you may think, 
how many of those baits are you guys going to keep? Well, the answer actually is we only kept one bag because he gave us 15 bags and I wanted to split it right down the middle. So we're going to give away to two lucky uh, supporting Patreon members. We're going to ship seven bags each for two winners. So you're going to win seven bags and I'm going to kind of go through some of the baits. Some of these baits are Ned baits. Some of them are not. So I'm going to kind of show you some of the baits that we've used as well over the years mm-hmm. of that we've been using Wham baits. So he actually has the Taxman, which is a three and a half inch drop shot bait. It's kind of like a thin leech. I really Super like cool. Those. Yeah. Andrew has a bunch of them. This is just a natural green pumpkin color. Can't go wrong with that. I always think whenever Wes uh, puts orders together for us for giveaways and stuff, he always gives us colors that I really want. And then when <laughs> I have to give them away, it's almost like torture. So that's, that's one. Another really good uh, mold that he has. It's the 2.8 inch quiller. It's like a drop shot bait. I would say you could also put that on a really small jig. This is going to be good for I use you know, small mold bass. Micro chatterbait trailers. They're really good. Yes. hundred percent. I could see that. So small with bass, walleye, panfish, anything like that. He has a bunch of his um, wambunctious, which is a three and a half inch uh, swim bait or sorry, swim jig, chatterbait trailer. You could also do a lot of things with it. You could put it on a flipping jig. It's basically a double tail grub. Mm-hmm. I used a bunch of packages this year. Uh, I got a bunch of colors. I got green pumpkin, uh, purple, which is another one of my favorites that he has. And I got white, great on a chatterbait, great on a swim jig. He has some of his craw baits, three and a half inch crosher. This is actually one of, I'd say one of his most productive baits. He has the Swimpleton, which is a 3.25 mm-hmm. inch swim bait. It's just a little swim bait. And he has these in green pumpkin. This on a little jig head, smallmouth candy. Also really good for walleye. Those I really like with like a beetle spin. It's yes. fantastic. Fantastic. Yes. Again, because we're doing a Ned Rig episode, we have a whole bunch of packages of his Ned baits to give away. And again, a whole bunch of different colors. Another really <laughs> cool bait that he has. That's right. This is taking one of those out of the package for each of you. And he's keeping the It rest. says eight <laughs> per package, but there's only going to be seven. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't apologize. He has these really cool two and a half inch uh, goby baits, which are also could be used as a Ned bait as well. These are going to be good for ice fishing as well. If you're fishing for white fish or lake trout, that's another really good mold that he has. And of course, one of his most popular, he has the Woblins which is his stick bait with the bulge in the middle has a really cool action. And this is a new one. I thought I'd mentioned to you guys. This is his, his names are always so wacky. I'm not going to pronounce them right. It's a 6.25 inch. So six and a quarter inch, a uh, finesse essential. So he put finesse and essential together. Eh? See what he and did essential. there? How would you describe this? I guess it's like a, it's a finesse worm with kind of like a spoon tail, mm-hmm. like a, like a flat beaver paddle tail. You could rig this so many different ways. I was talking to him. You could Texas rig it. You could Neko rig it. You could do drop shot. You could do anything with this thing. It's just like a very versatile bait. And guess what? Green pumpkin. What? And a bright color on the tip too. Yeah. Here's another bait that you could also rig on a Ned. He has his little 3.5 inch whammunitions, which is like a beaver style bait, but I have never seen them this small before. Mm -hmm. It's like a little three and a half inch. I actually bought a bunch of these at CanCast. Really good jig trailer, but you could also just fish this on a little football jig head yeah. or a little jig and just hop it along the bottom. Looks it's just e- like it's a crawfish. It's even really good if you want to finesse like pitching rig. Like you get a nice little oh, yeah. finesse jig with those. It pairs really well and it's, you're fishing the same way as you're fishing your other beaver style baits. 100%. And then the, the other bait that I'm going to show you guys real quick is uh, he has his Wamphibians, which are like a topwater frog, but don't sleep on these as a swim jig trailer. I learned that this year. Me and Andrew went fishing for a day. And I put this on the back of a white jacked up jig, swim jig, really cool action. Very unique, very cool. And it can give it a little, little bit of lift too. If you rig it like, like you would a top water, let's say it has a lot, a wide surface area. So it gives a lot of lift. So you have a slightly, if your jig is too heavy or you just want it to ride a little bit shallower, rig that like you would a top water uh, style and put that on a swim jig and it just like comes like right through it. It's really cool. Yeah. And another bonus is it skips like a, like a, a charm. Like when you, <laughs> well, you don't chip, you don't skip charms, I guess, but it skips really good. Like, cause of the big fat wide bottom, when you whip that, you can skip that right underneath trees and docks. If you're, if you're any good, I, I hit it about 50% of the time, the other half, I don't know. <laughs> so this is another bait. I thought I mentioned quick wham baits. It's called the wham solo. I'm going to open this up quick. This is also green pumpkin. Smell this. Oh yeah. Wham uses his own wham sauce. <sighs> But this is his Wham Soul. This is actually a completely, yeah, <laughs> completely custom mold that he designed. This could also be used as a as a Ned bait. 
-hmm. It's segmented body, so you can actually break it off wherever you want. So you could have a regular three inch, you could do four inch. I think these are four inch, four and a half inch. So you could go in half inch increments. You could use it for many different things. Little, I was saying to Wes that I'd use that for a little Neko rig on the bottom. It's very versatile little bait. It's got a little forky little yep. wrench like tail in the back. I would use that as a trailer. And then when the tail gets bit off, I just put it over onto my Ned head. <laughs> yeah. a perfect Ned rig with the, with the tail gone too. It'd still be a great Ned rig. Wham is very into versatile baits, like we we're saying. And this is one of those baits that you could use for probably 10 different things. Mm -hmm. So that's another cool one. So anyway, long story short, we'd like to thank Wes again for this giveaway. We're going to give away, I think it's 15. So we're going to say seven to two uh, winners. Mm -hmm. And uh, going forward, Andrew is actually going to be doing the Patreon a video giveaway so if you don't win you can get mad at him <laughs> before we end andrew i have a little secret uh i thought we could just go a little bit over time on this podcast because Ooh. i asked a question on instagram today and i said it's podcast night ask us anything i haven't looked at instagram today so i yeah i have no idea what this <laughs> terrible so i thought we could do the five best questions. Okay. So if we don't read your question, it wasn't one of the best ones. I'm sorry. That's right. And we're, we're being polite. We're just saying try harder. Yes. There was actually, <laughs> actually Seven a, questions. a decent <laughs> amount. Well, I'd say about 20. Ontario Outdoorsman asked, and this is not one that we're going to answer. But he says, are you guys interested in hunting? The answer is no. We like fishing. This is a fishing podcast. So no. I, I will say, just to answer that briefly. I used to, I used to do hunting, but I only have enough time and money for one hobby, barely. And I choose fishing. <laughs> yes, I agree. I, I barely have time to go fishing. I'm not going to add another expensive hobby into my repertoire. I use all my vacation days for the water. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, Thornburn in the fifth asked this question. He says, how do you become a professional bass angler asking for a friend? You are asking the wrong people. We don't even know how to catch bass. <laughs> you should call up Corey Johnson or the Johnson brothers and ask them. Yeah. So here's a, here's a really good question um, from River Smalley's Ontario. So he says, are you concerned about losing access to water in Ontario due to private landowners? You know, this is a big topic because mm -hmm. they just shut down the Ganaraska for salmon fishing. I'm not going to ruffle any feathers to say if I agree with that or not. But I mean, that should have happened 20 years ago, probably. A lot of people are saying that. I'm not saying I'm going to say that. But I'll give you an example. I fished this creek near my grandparents' house where they lived for 70 years. Mm -hmm. And I fished this creek my whole life. My dad fished the creek his whole life. And a few years we went and they posted it all, private property. And we can't fish there anymore because you'll get a fine if you fish there. So it is happening all over Ontario. Creeks, lakes, different areas on the waterfront are being closed You know, for, for angling. The problem is, I feel like, in my opinion, sometimes... Anglers do this to themselves because a lot of the ones that are fishing there are deadbeats and they're, you know, doing illegal things. They're leaving garbage. They're breaking stuff on people's property. Things get closed because people do stupid things. Mm -hmm. That's not always the case. Not everyone does it, but there are enough people who do that that makes an issue for everyone. Yes. Now, is that the reason why they close down a lot of places? There are other reasons. I am concerned about it. I I've said this more than a few times that. You know, I, I don't trout fish as much anymore because a lot of the streams that I fished growing up, they're all closed. Mm -hmm. And that is concerning because I have a lot of people asking me, like, where do you go trout fishing? It's like, I don't go trout fishing much anymore because, you know, it's, it's hard to get access anywhere near my house. So, you know, it is concerning. What can we do about it? I don't know. If you have any suggestions, let us know. We can talk about that on a future podcast. That'd be a great episode if we can talk to someone about that. Mm -hmm. in, in the meantime, I just want to say regarding that. It's important to always remain respectful. So if you, if something is posted now, like she said, there's a creek that his family has been generationally fishing that they just can't anymore. We don't go there anymore. Unfortunately, it, it's disappointing. Yes. If we are fishing a, a place that does have access, we take our stuff out with us. Sometimes we'll pick up extra garbage and throw that out on the way too. It's all about being respectful. If everyone was more respectful, we would have far less of these issues most likely. So just don't make a stink about it in some of these places. It might just make the situation worse. So just be yeah. respectful with what laws are unfortunately in place now. And ghillie suits are not cheap, man. <laughs> so here's a good question from Ryan at, at uh, Angling Attic. Uh, we actually met him at our uh, AOA meetup. Yep. Super nice guy. Hammer and angler. And he asked this question. He says, what do you find yourself throwing more for musky? Big tubes or medusas tubes i'm a big say, tube guy yeah 
Uh, now, I haven't caught one on guy. either yet, but uh, tubes are what I've been trying to throw more. Because I for a while, I was casting a lot of hard baits. I really want to get them a hard baits. And I have, uh, but I haven't caught any on like a rubber at all. Oh, yeah. So That's going to really change this go, fall. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to fish in tubes primarily, I think. I feel like medusas and bulldogs are, you know, they've been so popular for decades now. And they're great baits. I actually have a Medusa right here, but this is not a big Medusa. This is a a mini Medusa. So this is, this is pretty much the second smallest one you can get, but (laughs) I really got turned on tubes were kind of one of those like secrets that guys were fishing. Now they're kind of more popular. Everyone's chucking them, but they work really good. They have just like a very natural gliding erratic action. And after I fished with Bobby Belmonte, I really, you know, learned how to fish them properly. I was fishing them all wrong. I was trying to fish them like a big, you know, a, like just hard pulling pull pause bait they're the opposite you got to fish them nice and slow with just hard you know like little jerks upwards i find and it just gives them this just erratic you can almost walk the dog underwater and for whatever reason the musky they absolutely crush them like we have to think tubes have been popular for how long for for bass mm-hmm. and for crappy fishing and you know for for musky it's been a you know probably a few decades now that tubes have been on the market right but they work for everything. They're just great baits. If, if you want to catch a muskie this fall and you have a muskie set up, <laughs> I wouldn't chuck this with a regular bass <laughs> here. But what I have here is a nine inch gator tube. Uh, Mike from Water Wolf Lures, he makes tubes from seven and a half inch all the way up to, I think he's like a 15 inch <laughs> magnum tube now. It's, it's yeah. absolutely, it's like the size of my arm. But I would say a good starting point is a nine inch or an 11 inch. And you just go out and you chuck that around some like deep and steep areas and just let it glide down and just twitch it back to the boat. Muskie just come out of nowhere and crush it. Remember that fish we caught last yes. year? I yes. was, I was reeling in this tube, not this one, a, a different color. And I was just talking to Andrew and I was just reeling it back and it had a little blade on the bottom. And I'm like, Hey, look at that blade. And this muskie just came out of nowhere and just, boom, just chomped it right <laughs> side the boat. And we're both, Oh yeah. <laughs> so they do work. And I'm really excited to for andrew to catch his first fish on a tube i'm literally gonna i'm gonna tie a tube onto his onto his rod and i'm gonna weld the snap shut (laughs) so he can't take it off all day and then i'm gonna throw his tackle box in the lake and that's all he'll be able to throw so i'm excited for that and again we're not accomplished musky anglers by any chance but of the last few biggest fish that i've caught they've all been on Mm-hmm. well most of them have been on tubes one was on a big spinner bait but yeah another reason why i want to use a tube instead of the hard rubber is just hookup ratio not ratio so much but the, the the need to set the hook like super hard on those big rubber baits those hard rubber baits is, is you got to pull it through all their teeth and like get those hooks in so you really got to have a super strong rod uh to do that with which again you're musky fishing you're casting that bait you will but tubes, because they're so soft and and they're squishy and stuff, it's a lot easier to get those hooks in the mouth. So I just feel like I'll have a better chance of if I botch the hookup ratio, there's still a good chance it'll still get hooked on a tube. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I botch the hookup true. hook set. That being said, though, I I'm a big fan of medusas. They've got medusas are the big baits with the big three big twister tails on the back. They're a great bait too. So I mean, I I think when it comes to any type of fishing, but especially musky fishing, especially is throw the bait that you're the most confident in look at two baits and be like which one is going to catch fish like which one do i think is going to catch more fish and generally unless you're completely dumb you're throwing top water in november hey. pick the bait that <laughs> <laughs> pick the bait that you know that is proven to work but pick the color and the bait that you have the most confidence is and then just go out and chuck that bait and you're more likely to catch a fish on that bait if you have confidence in it so you can also get secondhand confidence like andrew knows how much mm-hmm. i love a tube because I've caught some of my biggest muskie on tubes. So now he automatically is confident in that tube, even though he's never caught a fish on one, which is great. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes you can gain confidence by fishing with someone else that has had success on a technique. Or if you go with a guide, like when I went with Bobby Belmonte, I, I had never caught a fish on a tube. And he's like, oh, chuck this tube here, blah, blah, blah. And I caught a fish. And again, I was with a guide. So it's kind of like, you know, it's not like I did it all by myself, but I caught the fish on the tube. I have confidence now. And then the next time we went out fishing, I was chucking that tube and I caught one on my own and I was so happy. So, you know, gain confidence, watch some YouTube videos, go fishing with someone and basically just buy a bunch of tubes and go fishing. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's do one more question. I was going to do five, but we went like super overtime. 
just edit more of the main topic out. No one wants to hear me that much. It's like now about Ned rigs. So <laughs> musky tubes. <laughs> <laughs> Someone asks, do you use Megabass rods? If so, what action? Um, I have owned three Megabass rods, nothing higher than the, I've never, I've always wanted an Orochi, never got one. I had three Levantes. I still own two of them. Great rods. I'm not a big mega bass, like high end rod guy. I have for the Levante, I have the Leviathan, which is the 710 extra, extra heavy swim bait rod. I had the 75 Brailless, which is like kind of a bottom contact rod, which is a great one. I guess only two then, but great rods. I'd recommend them for sure. I like using their lures. <laughs> so here is this guy named Nick. He always misses our Q and A's. Every time he asks me, oh, can I ask a question? I'm like, dude, you got to follow the Instagram. And he's like, I missed it. I missed it. So he actually commented. I finally noticed an AOA Q&A. <laughs> so we got to read. We got to read his questions. So he said, he asked me this question before, but I thought we could talk about it on the podcast. Mm -hmm. He says, older rods from his childhood. He has a bunch of six foot bait casters. He says, are there any valid use for them now that he's six foot tall? So I remember him asking me, should he have the shorter rods or should he get some longer rods now that he's, you know, an adult and six foot tall? So I kind of explained to him like, yeah, like there are some techniques where shorter rods are great, like skipping. Oftentimes, remember back in the olden days, like me pistol and Andrew, grip. yeah, the five pistol grip, like foot. little five, five and a half foot rod <laughs> pistol grip, I and you'd want be skipping. <laughs> yeah. Now, guys, you know, a short rod now is probably six ten. That's kind of like a short rod now, and even a seven foot rod. That's kind of like the low end of of lengths. Unless I'd say, unless you're using a rod, a short rod for a specific thing, like say you're fishing a jerk bait in a canoe, or you're skipping baits usually in a smaller boat, if you're in a, a taller boat and you know, the gunnel's a lot higher, mm -hmm. a six foot rod may not be that advantageous because you're going to lose a lot of casting distance. You're going to lose a lot of leverage when you're fighting a fish. There's lots of not very many advantages to a short rod. So, you know, I'd keep them if they're still good rods, definitely keep them, mm -hmm. you know, keep them for skipping or whatever you're going to use them for. But generally I'd, I'd recommend at least seven foot rods, especially if you're six feet tall, just for all the added, you know, advantages of having a longer rod right if if they're older and they're like i am five graphite or they're like a mix or they have, or they have fiberglass uh reaper them into trolling rods because those things again trolling rods don't have to have a special action and if they're soft if they're more of a soft parabolic bend they're going to be good for that anyways too and here's the last question i'm just going to ask this to andrew uh, elijah asked this question he says how does your beard stay so clean <laughs> Well, what you don't see is before every episode, uh, me and Jesse kind of pick at each other like monkeys, getting all the gnats out and stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> gross! <laughs> uh, it's all just uh, combing it and using beard oil and beard balm and stuff just to keep it nice and clean. Get all those cookie crumbs out of it. So anyway, we'd like to thank again. Huge thank thanks to Wes at Wham Bates. If you are down to support, and you should be, don't be like, I'm not down for that. You should be. If you're down to support... <laughs> A local guy lives in Ontario, does a lot for the fishing community, makes fantastic baits, and has been putting in the time and effort. And you have to think how much planning and testing goes into his baits before he puts them out on the market. Definitely give Wham Baits a follow. I'm going to put all of his links down below for his YouTube, his Instagram, all that stuff, his website, so you guys can support him. If you don't win the giveaway, which we're going to do right away. We're going to start doing the giveaways. We're going to have the podcast on Sunday released. We're going to announce the giveaways by Friday that week. So if you don't win the giveaway, make sure you go over to his website or his Instagram, pick up some of his baits for the fall. And if you don't anyway, just give him a message and be like, hey, Jesse and Andrew said to say hi. That's all you have to do. That'll make him happy. That wraps up our 75th episode. And again, we got Jesse's viewpoint on it, but I can't believe he made it this far either. But I hope you enjoyed talking about doing kind of a deep dive, just like they're going to deep dive into the bottom of the water on Ned Riggs. <laughs> what a stretch Jesse is like. This guy's never hosting again. <laughs> I'm doing a hundred episode. <laughs> I am. I'm going to do the hundred episode. <laughs> but we want to thank you again for listening. Huge thanks again to all our Patreon members. Again, you are all automatically entered to win these awesome giveaways like Western Wham Bates has put together for us. Two fortunate winners are going to win this time. So even better odds. You got to you gotta Ooh. love that. And again, thank you to all our, our listeners as well. If you have a chance to rate us, review us on 
on your Apple streaming service or on Spotify, anything like that, that really helps us. Uh, we're actually having a lot of really good feedback on the ratings. So please keep them coming. We love to read the even some of the interesting ones on the air. So if you can write a little a little blurb more than just great podcast, that's awesome. If you want to put a little sentence about what makes you appreciate it or what you really like about it, better chance we're going to actually feature it uh, on the podcast itself. So there's always an opportunity for that. If you type out a fun little song, Andrew will sing it. <laughs> Can't say I'll do it justice, but I'll try. <laughs> And just to be, you know, just to be clear, you don't have to write it yourself. You can, you can use AI. We don't care. Andrew will still <laughs> sing it. Uh, but I do use AI to, to, to weed out all the, all the junky reviews. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, thank you very much again for listening. And before we end the episode, as tradition states, we have the quote of the week. And to handle that, Jesse. Well, I am wearing my Wham Bates t-shirt that I got from Wes, which is pretty cool. But this is the quote of the week. Don't you dare go to bed before you order some Ned from Wham Bates. (laughs) 